Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service here at Herkin Baptist Church. Uh, it's good to have you with us this morning and we pray all is going well for you. We've had some beautiful weather and we pray this fall weather continues a while before that old snow starts flying again. But this is the day the Lord has made and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm uh, just privileged to share a few words this morning with you from the, the book of 2 Thessalonians. If you remember, if you followed along in the last few weeks, we've been in 2 Thessalonians and talking about the, the end times and what's going to happen toward the end. And as Paul had written to the church at Thessalonica in the first Thessalonica, first Thessalonians, he, um, he said, you know what, you don't have to worry, there's going to be a rapture of the church, the church is going to be taken out, and then the, the day of the Lord will come, and that's the day of judgment. So we see that they felt pretty secure with that. They had been worried about those that had died and their families and that before. So now we get to 2 Thessalonians, and if you remember last week we talked about the, the idea that uh, uh, some were coming out and they said, you know, I had a vision that, hey, this is the day of the Lord right now. And, and they're going through so much persecution, I mean, even to the point of martyrdom, that, that they're, they're bothered anyway. And now they hear these rumors about the day of the Lord started, and they think, wow, you mean we're going to have to go through that? Paul just got through telling us we wouldn't have to go through that, and now it looks like we're going through it. So what's the truth? So Paul's writing this uh, second letter here <clears throat> relatively quickly to uh, reassure them that, hey, just pay attention to what I told you. And so let's just go back and we're going to start off. I'm going to read those first five verses in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. We'll read the next how he leads us up then to today's text. We'll be starting in chapter 2, verse number 6 for today. So let's go to chapter 2, verses number 1 through 5. He says, now, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So he's referring there back to chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians about the rapture. He said, that ye, ye be not soon shaken in mind or tro be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of the Christ or day of the Lord is at hand. So he said, don't, don't get all worried about those things that people are saying, all these things that they're using to say that it's true. Don't believe them. Don't get shook up. Don't get all bothered. Let no man deceive you, in verse 3, by any means. For that day shall not come except... They're coming falling away first. And we talked about apostasy at the church, uh, the, the professing church falling away. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So here we're talking about the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, Paul's reminding us, so remember that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So Paul has explained that we don't get all of everything that he, he told them back in the first uh, Thessalonians, but we, he's saying, I've, I've told you, explained this all to you, so now just remember. And so that's some of the things that we need to do as Christians. We need to remember where we were, remember the promises of God, so we look to the days ahead, and, and we don't have to be fearful. Uh, there, yeah, we can be troubled to a certain extent. We can be questioning what's going on, when's it going to happen, but, but we don't have to be fearful about it. We don't have to be letting it get us all shook up to where we can't operate, to where it bothers our walk and our testimony. So let's get down now to chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. We're going to see here that uh, the restraining force he talks about. <clears throat> and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then, verse 8, and then uh, shall that wicked uh, be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So he's talking here, he says in verse 6, that you know, okay, I've, I've told you what, the word what there actually represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, that word what uh, there and then down in verse 7, only he, the he and the what are the same thing, the same person, they're the Holy Spirit. So we say here that, um, for you know that, no, the Holy Spirit holdeth or withholdeth that he might reveal in his time. Now he's talking about the Antichrist. So what we see is the Holy Spirit is, is holding, holding back the evil, holding back the lawlessness until the appointed time that, that the Antichrist should be revealed. Now God has a time and we don't understand his timing by, by any imagination. But he has a time that he does things, and it, it fits right within his plan. Uh, if you remember over in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, In the fullness of time God sent his Son. 
And so Christ had been prophesied for years and years and years. The Messiah was going to come, was going to come. And when the time was right in God's timetable, then He sent His Son. And this, as we look at this unfolding of the end times, we know that God, when the timing is right, God is going to reveal the lawless one. The, he's going to reveal the Antichrist now. We look at what's going on in the world today with the, the pandemic and all the riots and the protests and all these things going on around the world. The government's being overthrown and uh, persecution of Christians and all these things. We see all this going on. And it, it, <coughs> excuse me, it indicates that we're getting closer to that time. And of course, common sense says we are getting closer. Each day we get closer to that time when, when the Antichrist will be revealed. So he, we see there in verse 6, he says that the Holy Spirit's holding that until that time for the mystery, verse 7, for the mystery, a mystery in Scripture is something that has not been previously revealed. Uh, we see that over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he starts talking about the rapture of the church. That's the first mention of the rapture of the church. And he says there that uh, the mystery, you don't, under, this is a mystery. I show you a mystery. And so this right here, the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness. Iniquity has the idea of being a lawless, what uh, uh, that's unrestrained evil. We don't understand all about it. We we know that when when the, the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, uh, then there there be no restraining force. Uh, the, the evilness will run rampant. Uh, as I was just reading and studying over this, I thought about back over in Genesis chapter 6. You remember over in Genesis chapter 6, the story of Noah. And I just copied down one of the verses here. It says over in Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse number 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great, or that's multiplied in the earth, and that every imagination, the word imagination has every purpose, every desire of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So back there in, in Genesis chapter 6, when God looked at the world, and there's a lot we can look at there in chapter 6, but as God looked at the world and the condition of man at that time, he said, well, I said, they, they, it is bad. I mean, all they ever do is think about evil. All they ever want to do is what's bad and contrary to my word, contrary to what I want them to do, to live a righteous life. And remember when he looked down, he said, finally, well, I think I'll destroy the whole world. Start all over again. But then he looked and he found Noah and he found a man of righteousness. And then we know the rest of the story, how the ark was built and so forth. But at that time in the world, there was this unrestrained evil. The evil was just pouring out and God brought, of course, the, the uh, judgment of the flood. We see in the end times when this evil, this, this rebellion against God, this apostasy just unfolds and just builds and builds and builds. God says, that's enough. Do you pass the point of repentance? I'm going to pass, I'm going to send judgment on the earth. And of course we know then the, the seals and the, the trumpets and the vials all come as part of the, that judgment in Revelation. So uh, we can't imagine what it's going to be like, but we know it's going to be something so horrible. And when the, the influence of the Holy Spirit is taken uh, out, when the church is taken out, his influence will be removed. Let's go to verse 7. He says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let. The word letteth doesn't mean to allow. It means to restrain. Okay? So he's holding back until he be taken out of the way. That he, being the Holy Spirit, and he's not, he don't just leave the whole world, but he's taken away. The restraining power of the Holy Spirit, that restraining of the of sin of man is being taken away. He's still here. In fact, we can see evidence. We know that, of course, God is omnipresent. God is always here. But as we look at the Holy Spirit, that restraining force against evil is taken out of the way. But he still has a ministry because we see later on the 144,000 are sent out, the 144,000 evangelists, if you would, 12,000 meet tribe, and we know people get saved. So during the tribulation time, people will get saved, and we know there's only one, they get, one way they get saved is through the power of the Spirit and the Word of God. And then when they, faith comes by hearing, so we see that action. So we know the Holy Spirit is still here uh, during that time. Uh, when the, the Christians, uh, that force of the Christian church, where the church has moved out. We're going to see this, uh, all the things that's going to be poured out, that lawlessness, that unrestrained evil. Uh, I think about what we see today, and we think it's so terrible. Uh, sex trafficking, we see the, the, the pedophiles, the, the, the abuse of children, uh, the abortion, uh, all the lying and cheating, the drug abuse. There'd be no, there'd be no holding back. I mean, people just do what they want to do, and, and we can just imagine the chaos and, uh, and uh, the situation of the world. And so uh, we get a little sample of it in the world today. So we see what's going on We here. Now and then we hear about these people that are caught up in all this sex trafficking and the drugs and all these things. And 
And we wonder, how can anybody do those things? Well, there's going to come a time when that, when the Holy Spirit, His influence through the church is pulled away and that evil is going to run rampant. And uh, uh, that day, sometimes you get feeling like, you know, it may not be that far away. Uh, the question, I just want to pause right here for a second. So, uh, this is a sign of the end times, okay? Uh, you have to know you're alive today. If you're hearing this today and you're not a Christian, you need to pay attention because uh, the time is coming. If the rapture would happen and you're not saved, uh, there's, it was a series about this being left behind. And you would be left behind to, to face this. But the good news is, and we're going to see, we can see that a little bit later on, the good news is you don't have to. <laughs> the great news is, it's not just good, it's great news that you can put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be delivered. If you remember over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says that we're not appointed to the wrath of God through Christ Jesus. So we get a little bit, go back to our text here. So we see this going to, what's going to happen, there's going to be this unrestrained sin. Something's going on. So we get on down here to, and he says here then, the, the Holy Spirit's going to restrain. He's going to restrain until he be taken out of the way. So then the floodgates will be opened up. Okay, let's go down to verse number 8 then. And we see here, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So he says there then, now the Antichrist is going to be revealed. The real Antichrist. Uh, we read over in uh, 1 John, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, I think over in 1 John 2.18, he says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, and that's what we're talking about right now. Even now there are many antichrists whereby we know that is the last time. An antichrist is one that, that is against Christ. And we know today there's antichrist out there. They're, they're preaching and they're teaching and they're, they're trying to lead people away from God. They're trying to lead people away from Him. They don't want Him to walk uh, with Christ according to the Word of God. They, and where Jesus says, uh, love, uh, the antichrist says hate. Where Jesus says, forgive, uh, the, the uh, Antichrist says, don't forgive. Uh, uh, where the one says, uh, do good, Jesus says, do good. To those that persecute you, those that harm you. And uh, the devil or the Antichrist says, get even. See, we see the opposite sides of the coin. And that's what's going to be happening in these last days when we get past the rapture. We get into the day of the Lord. All the things that we look at as being so horrible today, they're going to be manifested in abundance. But the church won't be here. We are a restraining force. You say, well, uh, those things are going on today. There's murder today. There's uh, wild sex. There's drugs. All the, but, but it's not what it's going to be like then. Yeah, all those things happen today. That's just the uh, natural man's. Man does those things. But the day is coming when it's going to be so abundant. And that's the end time. That's God's judgment then being poured out on the earth. Man is good. Listen, man is finally going to get his wish. Get out of the way, God. Leave me alone. I want to do what I want to do. We hear people say that all the time. I, I, I don't need God in my life. I want to do what I want to do. And God's going to get to the point. He's going to go ahead and do it. And when all that starts happening, all those people, all the misery, when God, when the influence of God is out of the picture, what's it going to be like on this earth? It's horrifying. It's, it's, it's beyond imagination when it comes to how horrible it's going to be. And we see here, he says for the, in verse 8, then, then shall that wicked one be revealed and he'll be opened up. This is the real Antichrist, the real deal. We've had all these other Antichrists through the years and they've been going since uh, the days of Christ. All these teaching, all these things going on to even up to today. But the day is coming when he's going to be revealed. And there will be no more guessing, no more wondering what it is. I... I believe in the rapture, and I don't believe we'll be here to find out who it is. I believe he'll be alive at the rapture. I have no doubt about that. He'll be a person, uh, like a lot of people talk about being someone in their, their 30s or 40s. Somebody that's, that's brilliant and, uh, and knows how to do all kinds of things. Great in government, great in business, great in an orator, where he just talks and people just believe him. We see all these things that are going to come to pass. And he says here then, Here's, here's his destiny. We're going to talk a little bit more in uh, verses 9 on down. But here in, in verse 8, we say that he's going to be revealed. But here, here's the, the consolation. Uh, here's the, the um, if you want to say, the encouragement to those that are believers in that. Because here's what's going to happen. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see, uh, he don't win. 
All right. Uh, the, the Antichrist doesn't overpower God. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our Savior, he does not overcome. He says, the Lord will come, shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. I'm going to go back over to uh, Revelation. A little, a little encouragement for you here, if you would. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm going to look at verses 17 to 21. Okay, so if we looked up a little bit earlier, uh, let's go just, I'll look at verse 11 while we're here. And I saw heaven opened, and, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he did judge and make war. And it goes ahead and says in verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now we're going to jump on over here to uh, verse 16 says, And he had on, had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. See, this is, this is that day. This is the second coming of Christ that we're talking about here in Revelation 19. And verse 17 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. There's going to be that battle of Armageddon here. And that, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And here's where we're going to get. And I saw the beast. This is the Antichrist. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So we see uh, the Antichrist and they call the beast here, and all his armies gathered together. They're going to come. They're going to, they're going to fight Jesus Christ. They're going to, there's going to be this major battle. He's going to come against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You talk about being uh, prideful. Uh, this is the epitome of that. And he says here, then um, he's come to gather together to make war against him that sat on the horse and his enemy. And listen, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. We don't read much about the false prophet, what we're talking about now, but the false prophet is there with him that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. Remember the 666 over in Revelation 13 there? And he says, uh, these, uh, these both, here, here's his destiny, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So when we read that back over in 2 Thessalonians, what did we see there? We see there that uh, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Here is coming Christ. He takes the beast. He takes the false prophet. He casts them alive. Now, they're alive. They're not dead. He's not captain, taking corpses. He's throwing these, these men. They're actually men under the influence of Satan. But they're actually men. They're cast alive into the lake of fire, uh, burning with brimstone. And the remnant which were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all fowls were filled with their flesh. So we see this mighty, uh, we're going to be there, but we don't have to lift a finger. And Jesus just takes care of all of it. So no matter how mighty the Antichrist appears, no matter how much people worship Satan and his power, and they're these satanic worshipers, and these atheists, and they look away from God, and they don't have nothing to do with God, but God is the God of gods. There is no other God. And Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he will take care of the Antichrist. The church is gone. We're out of here. We're raptured up into heaven. We're to be with him forever. Uh, we're going to spend seven years in heaven. And we're going to come down to earth with him here in Revelation 19. And after that we see if we would have stayed with that. We would have seen in Revelation 20 the setting up of the millennium. All these things will be happening. And then we get over to the end of chapter 20. And we see the judgment where finally Satan is to join the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet in the lake of fire. That's what they have to look forward to. So we, hear, we see here, though, the Lord's going to come, and uh, Satan's not going to reign forever. He's not going to be really revealing forever, he, reigning forever. He's going to be exposed. And then down to verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. His purpose is to carry out the work of Satan. Uh, he's going to be able to do a great things, great miracles. He'll be able to bring peace. He'll be able to feed the hungry. He's going to be able to do all these things to people. Health care, we, we hear a lot about today, about universal health care and how to take care of the sick. He's going to be able to take care of the sick. He's going to, be, he's going to have a plan. Everything's going to fall into place. It's going to be perfect. 
It's going to look so good. People say, why would we not want him to be in control? Why would we not want to, to follow him? He's, he's God. And that's what he wants to come across, remember? Up in chapter 2, verse 4 there. He wants to come across as God, and people are going to be caught up with that. We see today even now how uh, charismatic leaders, uh, they have such, a, such an influence. That they just speak, and people just believe them, and they, they say things that people want to hear, and, and they just get caught up with it. You know, these, these cult leaders that we read about, I remember years ago, I think it was a guy by the name of Jim Jones that, that uh, took, and there's a lot of people who took the poison and died just in his leading. Uh, it's, uh, it was amazing how people would do that, but they, these men, they have that ability just to, to convince people and to convict people and to bring people into their, their lifestyle and to believe like they do. And, and uh, what we're going to see there is that uh, he's going to have millions and millions and millions of followers. If we went back to Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse number 6, uh, we see in that portion of Scripture where Jesus is in the wilderness. And Satan has tempted him. And so uh, we get to that part in uh, verses four, uh, 5, 6, and 7. And the devil says, I'll tell you what you do. He said, I'll, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. I, I can give you all of this. You can have it all. Just look, look, you can have all these kings. All you have to do, just bow down to me. See, look at the world. The world's going to say, you know what? Look, the Antichrist can say, look at all I've done for you. And all I want you to do is bow down to me. The people that are listening to this, reading this letter. They understand Rome, and that's what Rome wanted. They, for at the, Especially at the beginning, Rome didn't have a big problem with Christianity. All you had to do as a Christian, if you would just bow down and acknowledge the Emperor Caesar as, the, as God, they didn't care about the rest of it. But see, Christians wouldn't do that. And when Christians wouldn't do that right away, then come the persecution because they would say, well, hey, they're not honoring Caesar. They're not considering him God. They have another God. And so then, of course, the Roman government got all worried about what's going to happen here. So then they started persecuting Christians. So the idea is that he says here that he's going to deceive them. He's coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to convict people, convince people that I am he. Remember, he lifted himself up. He gets up in the temple. He says, I'm God. And we see what and then the, the results is people start bowing down to him and start following him, taking that mark of the beast, that 666. That's so familiar. And then with all, verse 10, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in it, and then that perish. Okay, so what he's doing, those that, that are following after him, those are the ones that's going to perish. They're, they're perishing. And uh, the definition of perishing is to uh, lost, to be in the process of being destroyed or ruined, corrupted, and put to death. This, this person is, is walking away from God. The Antichrist is over here, and God is over here, and, and they're walking after the Antichrist. They're following, so their back is to God, and they can't see God. They're blinded. And the Antichrist has them blinded and they're following him and following him. And they're, they're, they're perishing. They're, they're actually dying. Maybe not so much in a physical sense, but they're, they're dying spiritually. They're dead. And they're, they're going to start decaying. And we see that in Luke 13, 3, it says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent. And Jesus is talking says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What does it mean to repent? It means to turn. It's not a work. People sometimes get caught and say, well, repent. If you have to repent, that means a work. No. It means, it means it's a change of mind, a change of direction. And if I want to use this analogy here that we're talking about as, as they're following Antichrist and they're following him and they hear the gospel. Remember, the Holy Spirit is still in this, the soul-saving business. And they hear the gospel, and if they turn from following the Antichrist and turn to God and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they have eternal life. But he said, and Jesus is saying here in, in Luke 13, 3, except you do that, you're going to perish. You're going to be just like all these people. And it, we, today, people, we witness to people, we talk to people, and it, it's hard to get them to see. It's hard to get them to understand, to get the blinders off, get the darkness away, get the light in. But it's going to be that much more difficult in that day and time. Let's go a little bit further before we run out of time here. He said, uh, so we see here that uh, he's just, they're taking the people, they're going to perish because, and here's the reason, okay? Here is the reason, and this is the reason that, that everybody perishes, that, that those that uh, die and go to hell, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. 
looking up that word received, that means to, to admit with heart and mind by implication to approve, embrace, or follow. They didn't take it. They didn't receive it. They didn't, they didn't receive it into their heart. They didn't believe it. And that's the key. They didn't believe what he said. They didn't believe what's going on. They, they want to reject it. They love not the love of the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, how God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God demonstrated His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. See, they, they wouldn't receive that. The word love there is a the benevolent kind of love. For God does for you what you need to have done for you, whether you want it or not. That's what He did for mankind. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died on that cross, shed His precious blood because man needed it. Man needed it to be redeemed, to be reconciled to God, so God did that. And then man has to do with it what's right by receiving that, believing that, putting their faith in that, and have eternal life. But they, these people don't, that they might be saved. That's right there at the end of that. Because they received not the love of the truth, the gospel, that they might be saved. Back over in uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse number 8. He says, the judgment and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same people, same idea. They turn away from God. They don't receive Christ. They don't believe it. So we get a little bit further here. So and we see here that what's going to happen. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Uh, when we look at that idea, uh, God sends, he gives them the opportunity. He shows them things and they can turn away from it. But they won't do it because of the hardness of their heart. And they reject what God wants to do for them. That they all might be, that they all might be damned. Listen, here, here's the ones that are damned now. Who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They believe not the truth. They reject God. They reject and allow the condemnation to come upon them. I want to close. We're going to go over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now I'm going to look at the verses over there real quick. And, uh, and we'll close over here in chapter 1 and verse 25. Okay? It says, Who changed the truth of God unto a, into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more or rather than the Creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. And we see the, so we see the result of this then when we look at verses 26 to 32. For this cause, because of this, God gave them up unto a vile or shameful or a perversion affections, perverted affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working in that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a, a reprobate, an a undiscerning mind, a mind that, that's uh, just uh, empty, no, lacks judgment, can't figure out anything right, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Unless there's a, all those are, there's other sins you could probably name in there, but it pretty well covers everything, all that. But but men are caught up in feeding their flesh, and they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the day is coming. The day is coming when that when that trumpet is going to sound. There's going to be that shout, and uh, and we're going to be raised up out of here in the rapture. And then seven years later, Revelation 19, he's coming again. He's coming again. If you're not saved at, before the rapture, when you get into the rapture, it's going to be that much more difficult because you have all these things going on and going against you. And to truly believe that anybody that heard the gospel prior to the rapture that goes, they're left behind, they won't be able to soften their hearts. Their hearts will be so hard that they just won't pay attention to it. Satan will deceive. So, in closing, I'm going to ask you this. Where do you stand today? If the rapture happened now, 
Would you be wondering where I went? Would you be wondering what happened? See, I truly believe that I know that I know that I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, and I know that when the rapture happens or when I die, I'm going to be in His presence based on His promises, based upon the righteousness I have because of my faith in Jesus Christ. It's not because I'm a good person or do anything good or sinless or anything else. No, none of those things. But the thing of it is, I put my faith and trust in Christ. I've repented. I turned from following Satan. I turned from following the world and put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to do that. It's, it's a necessity for eternal life. It's the only way. There's no steps. There's no work. There's nothing. Repent and faith in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do. We thank you for this day and for this time. We thank you for the truth of your word. And we know, Lord, that without a doubt that, that day is coming. The day is coming when the rapture will take place, when that wicked will be revealed, and all these things have taken place. And then in, we get to the 19th chapter of Revelation in John's uh, writing. We see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. King of kings and the Lord of the lords, we thank you for that truth, Lord. We believe it. We know it's going to happen. One of these days, all this is going to unfold. And we get off into eternity. So we just thank you for loving us. We pray, Lord, today for those that don't know Christ as their Savior, that this would be the day, that this would be the hour that they'll turn, repent, turn, put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in Him and Him alone for their salvation. We thank you again for loving us. We thank you for what you're going to do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.